Is it irrational to believe in miracles? The philosopher David Hume in his book Inquiry Concerning Human Understanding of 1748 replies with a categorical yes, it is always irrational to believe in miracles. Now his argument has provoked two different kinds of questions. First, there's a question of how we ought to interpret his argument. And then there's the question of whether or not he's right. In this video, I'm going to explain Hume's argument against miracles. And then I'm going to present some ways of interpreting it, as well as some replies that have been given to it. All in all, this is the kind of thing you might learn in a good philosophy degree program. But I'm going to do my best to make it as understandable as I can. So, if you put on your thinking cap and follow along closely, your patience will be rewarded. And if you stick around to the end, I'll tell you what I think. By the way, I have other videos like this and more to come. So if Philosophy Made Simple sounds like your thing, then subscribe and I'll see you around. Now let's go. Let's start by looking at Hume's argument. The kind of argument Hume presents is what we call an epistemic argument, which means it's an argument about what we can know, or in this case, what we should believe. Hume's claim is that we should never believe a miracle has occurred. If we do, then we are being irrational, because a rational approach to the evidence should always lead to disbelief. Now, this isn't quite the same as arguing that miracles are impossible. But what it does mean is that even if miracles occur, then, rationally speaking, we shouldn't believe that they do. So now we know what Hume is arguing for. But how does he get there? Well, let's start by looking at his views about knowledge. Hume is an empiricist. Empiricists believe that our knowledge comes from our experiences. So if we are to be rational about a claim, what we need to do is to look for the evidence we have for or against that claim based on our experience. Why is it rational to believe, for example, that humans can't levitate? According to Hume, it's because we've experienced lots of humans before, and none of them have been levitating. So each experience we have of a non-levitating human is evidence for our belief that humans can't levitate. But what about times where we have evidence both for and against a claim? What, for example, should we believe about whether or not it will snow in England next year? Based on experience, Hume thinks that a person would be rational to believe that it will snow somewhere in England next year. But if it turns out that it doesn't, that wouldn't make the original belief irrational, because we have also experienced times when it doesn't snow anywhere in England. Hume thinks that to behave rationally, we need to weigh our experiences against each other and pick whichever beliefs have the most evidence in their favour. In some cases, like with our snow example, there can be evidence for both sides. And Hume thinks that the rational thing to do in such cases is to pick whichever has the most evidence in its favour, but believe it with a certainty that's properly reduced according to the evidence we have against it. But he also thinks there are some beliefs that have so much evidence in their favour and none against that those experiences count not merely as evidence, but as a proof of that belief. If there is a general principle that has this overwhelming evidence to the point of being a proof, then Hume thinks that we can safely take such beliefs to be laws of nature. Hume's approach means that his conception of a law of nature is broader than the kind of thing you might learn in a science class. Any generalization that consistently accords with the experience is, for Hume, a law of nature. So things like humans can't levitate, dead people don't come to life again, and that water doesn't instantaneously turn into wine are, for Hume, all laws of nature. We're now starting to edge a little bit closer to Hume's argument against miracles. But he doesn't jump there straight away. First, he considers another form of evidence that isn't directly based on experience, and that is evidence we get from testimony of other people. No doubt the testimony of other people is evidence in favour of certain things having happened. For example, if I didn't know what my wife had for breakfast this morning, but she tells me that she had eggs, then that's evidence in favour of believing that my wife had eggs for breakfast. But why is it evidence for that belief? According to Hume, once again, it comes down to the evidence we get from our experience. We have in the past experienced times when people have said something has happened, and it indeed has happened. 
In fact, most of the time when people say that things have happened, they have happened. But not all the time. We've also experienced occasions when people have lied or have been mistaken about what they saw. For any particular case, there are going to be a bunch of factors that affect how good that evidence from testimony is. If the person is known to be trustworthy and reliable, that is evidence that what they're saying is more likely to be true. Similarly, if they have no reason to lie, or even more so if what they say is against their own interests, that also gives us more evidence to believe in what they are saying. In fact, Hume allows that there could be a person that is so credible that the evidence from testimony amounts to more than mere evidence and becomes a proof of what has happened, much like the case with natural laws. We now have Hume's account about how to be rational about what to believe. We must weigh the evidence that we have and believe whatever has the most evidence in its favour to a degree proportionate with that evidence. And we also now have two kinds of evidence to consider – direct experience and the testimony of others. And testimony itself is also a certain kind of evidence based on our experience. But in this case, it's our experiences of the relationship between what people say and what has happened. With these ideas in place, we can now turn to the case that we're really interested in – miracles. Hume defines a miracle as a violation of a law of nature. And since laws of nature are understood as things which experience has repeatedly confirmed to us, a miracle would be an exception to that which experience has repeatedly confirmed to us – things like water turning into wine, and so forth. Hume now asks what it is rational to do if somebody tells you they have seen a miracle. And he replies, first of all, in accordance with what he has said so far. We must weigh the evidence both for and against the miracle. The evidence against the miracle will come from our direct experience, which tells us that, whatever the miracle is, it doesn't happen. And since this miracle is a violation of a natural law, that evidence against it must be overwhelming to the point of being a proof. The evidence for the miracle, on the other hand, will come from the person's testimony. But what if that person is so credible that their testimony amounts to a proof that the miracle has happened? What if, in other words, your experiences provide overwhelming evidence that this person always tells the truth, to the point at which it can be considered a natural law that they tell the truth? In such cases, if the person were lying or mistaken about what they saw, this would itself constitute a miracle of sorts. Regarding this kind of case, Hume says as follows. When anyone tells me that he saw a dead man restored to life, I immediately ask myself whether it is more probable that this person either deceives or has been deceived, or that what he reports really has happened. I weigh one miracle against the other, and according to the superiority which I discover, I pronounce my decision and always reject the greater miracle. If the falsehood of his testimony would be more miraculous than the event that he relates, then he can gain to command my belief or opinion, but not otherwise." This quote ends the first part of Hume's chapter on miracles, and so far what he has said is pretty uncontroversial. All he is saying is that the rational thing to do when being told of a miracle is to weigh the evidence you have both for and against it and believe whatever has the most evidence. So, so far, the door is still open for it to be rational to believe a miracle has occurred. But the second half of Hume's chapter goes further and argues that it is never the case that we have more evidence for the miracle than we do against it. But his argument in this section has several flaws. First, he assumes that the only evidence we could have for a miracle would come from the testimony of others. So it's not clear whether or not we could be rational in believing a miracle we believe we have seen ourselves. Second, Hume assumes that any miracle under consideration must have arisen within a particular religious context. Because of this, most of the reasons he gives for disbelieving in miracles rely on his somewhat cynical views about the psychology of religious belief. And it also leads him to make what seems to us like a very bizarre argument. He claims that when considering a miracle within a religious context, any miracle claims from outside of that religious context counts as evidence against the miracle we're considering. But in our multi-faith age, we're far more likely to take evidence for miracles in whatever religious context as evidence for miracles in general, rather than as evidence against them. 
Because the second half of Hume's argument is a little outdated, I'm not going to go into its details. If you want, you can read his chapter on miracles in his book. And for an overview of Hume's claims, as well as complaints raised against it, you can see Timothy McGrew's Stanford Encyclopedia article. As always, links to these works are in the description. But maybe Hume doesn't need the second half of his argument anyway, because it seems as though most of the damage has already been done in his explanation of how we ought to be rational. It seems that he's appealing to the general claim that whatever evidence we have for a miracle will always be less than the evidence we have against it, because there will always be a greater chance of illusion or deception being involved than there would be of a natural law having been broken. But rather than leave Hume's argument expressed in these rather loose terms, there are those who try to interpret Hume to make the idea more precise. One way to do that is to interpret the argument in terms of probabilities. So let's turn to that now. According to the philosopher Peter Millikan, Hume's claim should be understood as stating a theorem of Bayesian probability. What this theorem says is that the rational thing to do when given some evidence for a miracle is to ask whether, given this evidence, the occurrence of the miracle is rendered more or less probable than it's not occurring. In Bayesian theory, this theorem is so basic that it can be proved almost immediately from first principles. In other words, if this is all Hume is saying, then his argument seems to be true in a trivial way. One argument against interpreting Hume this way is that it seems to make his argument pretty pointless. If what he is saying is so obvious and so simple, why does he take so long to say it, and why has the argument become the subject of so much debate? Millikan's reply is that although Hume's argument is trivial from a certain point of view, it exposes a kind of irrationality that we as humans are prone to, a kind of irrationality sometimes called the base rate fallacy. The idea, which is borne out by data in psychology, is that humans often place too much weight on the latest piece of evidence they have when deciding what to believe and forget everything else they already know. So let's take a look at an example. Suppose there is some rare genetic disease that manifests in old age and is carried by one in a million people. Now imagine that you're concerned about this disease and so go to your doctor for a test. The test the doctor gives you is 99.9% .9 accurate, and when you take the test, it comes out positive. What, in this case, is it rational for you to believe about whether you have the disease? If you want to think about it for a minute before I give you the answer, then pause the video. If you thought that you should believe that you do have the disease, then you are in the overwhelming majority of people. Most people reason that since you took a test that is 99.9% .9 accurate, and that test tells you that you have the disease, then the chance of you having the disease must be 99.9%. .9 but to reason this way is to fall into the kind of irrationality that Hume may be warning against. The Bayesian formula tells you to consider not only the evidence you have for having the disease, which comes from the positive test, but also to consider the evidence you have for not having the disease, which comes from its extreme rarity. Once you take both probabilities into account, you find that your chances of having the disease are still very, very small. And so the rational thing to do is to believe that you don't have the disease. Now, in case you are not convinced, let's think about this a little bit more. Imagine a thousand million people take the test. That's a billion people if you're American. As one in a million people have the disease, a thousand of those people will have it. And since the test is 99.9% .9 accurate, of those 1,000, the test will correctly come out positive for 999 of them, while the other person gets a false negative. The rest of the people don't have the disease, but when they take the test, the vast majority, 99.9% .9 of them, will get a correct negative. But 0.1% of them will get a false positive, which is one short of a million people. So if you take the test and get a positive result, you could be one of the 999 people that have the disease and get a positive result. Or you could be one of the million people that don't have the disease but get an incorrect positive. So if you were to think rationally about the situation, you should gauge your odds of having the disease, even after testing positive, to be about one in a thousand. But most people don't. 
They think the odds of having the disease are a near certainty. Now let's get back to Hume's argument against miracles. Millikan thinks it is reasonable to suppose that Hume is warning, in an 18th century way, against falling into the base rate fallacy when reasoning about miracles. Whatever evidence we have for the miracle must be weighed against the chance of the miracle having occurred in the first place, which is presumably very low. Hume wants to make sure that we don't get too sidetracked by whatever the latest piece of evidence we have for the miracle, that we forget just how unlikely the miracle is to have occurred in the first place. So far we have accepted Hume's definition of a miracle as an event which violates a law of nature. But the philosopher R.F. Holland argues that this isn't what is important about a miracle. Instead, a miracle is some kind of coincidence that has a significance to humans, and that those humans attribute this event to a divine being and believe that thanks is therefore due. In order to prove his point, R.F. Holland tells a certain story. Imagine, he says, a toddler crosses a railway line but then gets his wheels stuck in the tracks. The mother sees her son getting stuck and hears a train coming from around a blind corner. The mother knows that the train driver won't have time to see her child and stop before impact. But to her amazement, when the train comes round, the brakes are applied and the train stopped inches before hitting her son. The mother believes this is a miracle and thanks God. Now what happened, as the mother later discovers, is that the driver has a medical condition that interacted badly with his lunch. This caused him to faint a few metres before the bend and let go of the control lever, which meant that the train's emergency brakes were applied and the train just so happened to stop a few inches before her son. In other words, there was a perfectly natural explanation for what happened that didn't involve any natural laws being broken. Holland argues that the mother is still being perfectly rational in thinking that what has happened was a miracle. Because what makes something a miracle isn't that it breaks a law of nature, but that it is something highly unusual that has significance to human concerns. What one person calls a miracle, another might call good fortune. The difference here concerns what that is attributed to. The person who believes it's a miracle attributes it to a divine being. The person who says it's merely good fortune attributes it to blind chance. Putting this kind of miracle aside, Orof Holland thinks there's still a case to be answered for, for miracles that seem to be of the law-violating kind. But even in such cases, Holland thinks that it's the significance of the event that makes it a miracle, and not the fact that it breaks any kind of natural law. For example, he says that if five grains of sand in the Sahara Desert were to teleport one inch to the east, that would violate a natural law, but he doesn't think that such a thing would constitute a miracle. So, maybe there are miracles of a non-law violating kind, and maybe it would be perfectly rational to believe that they have occurred and that they are miracles. But many of the miracles that are of particular religious significance are of a law violating kind, such as the resurrection of Jesus. So we should also stop to take a look at these cases. For this question, I'm going to discuss a famous paper by the philosopher Richard Swinburne. Swinburne challenges the idea that we would never have reason to believe that a violation of a law has occurred. First, he discusses the fact that often when we find evidence that flies in the face of a natural law, the response is to assume that the natural law needs to be updated in some way. Now, of course, when that happens, it's assumed that what has occurred isn't a miracle at all, but is instead a manifestation of a deeper natural law. After all, this is the way that science progresses. But Swinburne says that this would only be the rational approach to take if that event were repeatable and testable. Now, in such cases where new natural laws are sought, the violating event is assumed not to be a miracle. But Swinburne thinks there are also times when the rational thing to do is not to look for new laws to explain the violating event. After all, as Hume argues, oftentimes we have a mountain of evidence in support of the laws that we have. So if that violating event were a one-off, unrepeatable and untestable, then the rational thing to do would not be to get rid of all of our natural laws, but to accept the event as what it is a violation of the laws we have good reason to believe exist. But an event that violates natural laws is what Swinburne says a miracle is, so in such cases we'd be rational in believing both that we know what the natural laws are, 
and that this event is a violation of them. In other words, in such cases it would be rational to believe that a miracle has indeed occurred. Swinburne's discussion assumes that the supposedly miraculous event is one that has been directly experienced, and Hume's argument doesn't explicitly say anything about what we should believe under such circumstances. But Swinburne also thinks there are times when we should believe in miracles that we've only been told about, and that Hume is simply being stubborn to say that we shouldn't. Swinburne asks what it would be rational to believe if we had been told by, say, 200 highly credible people that a miracle had occurred. Surely, he says, at some point the rational thing to do would be to believe that it has indeed happened. Swinburne concludes his paper by saying that when the evidence both for a natural law and a one-time violation of it are sufficiently great, the wise man in such circumstances will surely say that he has good reason to believe that the event occurred but also that the law is a true law of nature, and so that the event was a violation of it. Now that I've discussed some of the broad philosophical positions there are concerning this debate, I'd like to bring some of these ideas together and tell you a bit about what I think. When you look at Swinburne, what you see is the idea that maybe there's a different approach that can be taken to the question. Rather than follow Hume and say that the evidence for the miracle and the evidence for the natural law must be weighed against each other, Swinburne presents the idea that perhaps we should look at them separately, and if there's sufficient evidence for both the law and for the miracle, we should just simply accept both. This raises the question of on what basis Hume says that we actually have to weigh the evidences against each other. And it's here that I think Hume struggles to come up with a good explanation. So suppose now we go to Hume and we ask why the evidence for a natural law must count as evidence against the possibility of the miracle having occurred. Perhaps Hume would say that that's because a natural law is the kind of thing that cannot be violated, and so evidence for a natural law is automatically evidence against any violation of it. But if that were his reply, then miracles are ruled out not by his argument, but by definition, since natural laws are things that cannot be violated, and a miracle is defined as a violation of a natural law. In which case, any believer in miracles would simply reject Hume's definition of a natural law, or his definition of a miracle, or both. A second reply available to Hume would be to say that evidence for a natural law is evidence against a violation of it, because natural laws are hardly ever violated. Although violations are not impossible, they would be very, very rare. Now this claim seems to be something even a believer in miracles would accept, in which case his argument then becomes more along the lines of what Peter Millikan says. The probability of a miracle occurring should be assigned something very, very low to begin with, and we should be careful about falling into the base rate fallacy when weighing our evidence for its occurrence. Now if we take this approach, which I think is the correct one, then it becomes at least possible for it to be rational to believe a miracle has occurred. How much evidence you would need for the miracle will depend on the probability you assign to the possibility of the miracle having occurred in the first place. To see how this might work, let's go back to our disease example. As we previously saw, after a single positive test that is 99.9% .9 accurate, a rational person should not believe they have a disease that only affects one in a million people. But if a second test comes out positive, then your chances of having the disease are about even. And after a third positive, the chances are now that you do have the disease. As this example shows, given enough evidence of whatever kind, it becomes rational to believe in even very, very rare events. The only reason to think it would always be irrational to believe in miracles is if you think miracles are simply the kind of things that cannot ever happen. And I can't help but think Hume probably falls into this category when I read his argument. My position then is that somebody who believes in a miracle could be behaving irrationally, but only if it's because they've fallen into the base rate fallacy and haven't considered the unlikelihood of the miracle occurring in the first place. But that doesn't mean that anyone believing in a miracle is behaving irrationally, because there can be times when the evidence for the miracle is sufficiently great to make it rational to believe that it has occurred. Thanks for listening. As you got to the end of this video, you must have liked it. So please do me a favor and hit the like button and subscribe too, because more videos will be coming soon. And as always, have a wise day.